Hello and welcome to this webinar from nmisskills.org. Uh, today we're going to be looking at webinars and screencasting, which is interesting that we're doing a webinar about webinars, but we'll figure out that weird singularity by itself. I am Lewis Ross from City of Glasgow College and this is... And I'm Joe Wilson from NMIS and City of Glasgow College. And really without further ado, I think we'll get cracking on our webinar. Uh, and as we as we go through our webinar, I hope you learn some lessons. Uh, I, hope, I hope not mistakes about webinars and, and screencasting. Uh, I will also show you uh, when we're done, what you can do after you've done your, your, your webinar. So really the objectives of today's session is to learn how to design appropriate presentations for digital delivery. So what you're going to use as the content of your webinar. Understand how to choose and embed appropriate technologies to enhance teaching and learning. So, so the kind of tools that you can bring in to your webinar. Eh, and to develop creative approaches to the use of technologies in delivery and assessment. So, so it's also to look at the other tools that you can bring into your webinar. Yeah, and I'll say just before we get going, we should probably define what we mean by webinar and screencast, because you might be joining this and not actually know what they really mean. Well, webinars is kind of, it's a seminar on the web is where the word comes from. So it's the idea of bringing multiple people into a session, usually live, and then having some form of seminar. It could be a teaching session. It could be just a meeting where you're discussing things. It's kind of one of these terms that gets used quite broadly, but it's generally meant for anything where you're bringing people together with a video feed in some uh, cases, most cases I would say, um, to learn something usually. And it's usually one person who's a presenter, us in this case, and participants, you in this case. Um, screencasting is very similar to webinars, but it's designed for not a live audience. So you're recording what's happening on your screen, on your computer screen, and you're then going to send that video to people at a later date so they can see what you're doing. Usually used for doing things like tutorials, showing people how to use a bit of software, but it could be also for giving people a tour of your website. Uh, other uses you can use it for are giving people marketing feedback on their essay. Very useful to go, here's where you said this in your essay, and this is what I thought about it. So those are kind of what those terms are. I think, uh, I think too, we have to chat about synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, some of you may be watching this, this live, uh, but even, even webinars, you can store, uh, record, and allow people to watch at a later date. Uh, so while some people will look at things synchronously at the same time, uh, what the evidence is that actually lots of people watch things asynchronously at a time that suits you. Uh, and you can still, if we set it up properly, you can still make comments and feed into the debate after the end of the synchronous mm -hmm. webinar. And a uh, good time to do a plug. All our webinars are hosted after the fact on our YouTube channel. And you can get links to that and the slides for the webinar on nmis-skills.org. You just look in the program section and go to the appropriate uh, title. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna really talk about when it comes to webinars is designing your materials for the webinar. So you don't just randomly grab whatever you've got, you need to think about how you're gonna be delivering this. And there's a few design points that you really need to think about when you're doing this. The first of all is, who is your audience? If you're delivering it to a bunch of your peers, you might want a more informal style. If you're delivering it to some people in a kind of higher up position in uh, an organization where you're trying to pitch to them, you're trying to get funding maybe, you might want to be very, very formal, have a very highly structured one. Or if you're doing a lesson, um, you know, think about the age group that you're pitching to. If it's younger children, you probably want some more fun, colorful stuff. If it's an older age group, they might be looking more just for the information and the facts. So really think about who your audience is and how you're going to design uh, towards that. I, th I, I think too, uh, and we're going to show you a range of, of technologies. And again, it's that bit of the, the technologies that are available to you that you can use on a, on, a, on a laptop or the technology that's available in a college or a university or a school or, or indeed in work-based work learning. You might pick the different technologies depending on what number of people you want or you expect to join the webinar synchronously. Uh, and that might dictate the choice of technology that you choose asynchronously. If it makes a recording, it doesn't matter so much because you can post it on YouTube, you can post it in various places where people can come uh, and have, have a look at it later. I think the other thing to stress, uh, and this is important for learning and teaching, uh, and particularly, I think, uh, for, for, for learners, uh, 
that this isn't lecture capture. You know, that the, the really webinars and all these things should, should give the audience an opportunity to chip in and to discuss uh, and to explore things. Uh, there is a place for lecture capture, but this isn't a, a, a webinar uh, is, is, isn't a place for lecture capture. Yeah, um, and as you're talking there about when the audience can chip in and stuff, Think about when you're going to take those questions. Are you going to take them throughout at any time? You can allow people to kind of break your flow, as it were, to answer questions. That can work really well for an informal style. Or if it's a more formal thing, you might have set points where you're going to discuss things or take questions, which is kind of what we've gone with this style, um, because we have quite a lot of materials to get through in small amounts of time. Um, we, we set our little discussion sections. We also have people in the chat who, who you can chat with each other and ask questions and stuff, and we'll try and get to them if we can during the discussion sections as well. So that's worth thinking about. So, so for instance, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're tuned in or, or you're picking up one of our future webinars, you'll discover that you're actually all on mute. So you can't, you can't interrupt us, but there is a back channel where you can ask us, ask us questions. Yeah, so we've got text chat there. So that's one of the things like, will we take audio or text responses? Um, Audio can be good if you've got a smaller number of people and you can really manage who's talking, but you want to make sure people are familiar with the technology because it's very easy for people to unmute themselves by mistake, start making lots of noise, not realize it's themselves, and then not know how to mute themselves again. Similarly, you want to be familiar with the technology you're using so you know how to deal with that and get them muted. So uh, audio is really good if it's a very discursive um, subject you're dealing with, but text is, is, is kind of what we've chosen here because it's more of a kind of questions or experiences that we're then going to look at at a later point. So if you can put what they think of in the chat now, and we'll get to it later on, so it allows that more asynchronous questioning. Um, also have a think about, are you going to be using any uh, tools externally? So in this case, we're talking about interaction tools, but it could be anything at all. So you're going to use something to take polls with people, um, getting them to make word clouds using something like Mentimeter, which we discussed previously. Are you going to be using that in your webinars? Are you going to be using some outside software? So we use the G Suite stuff a lot. So in our last webinar about collaboration, you've seen myself and John were set up. We were both logged in, ready to go with those external tools. So you don't want to be messing about during the webinar, trying to get things working. It does happen. Sometimes things log you out automatically while you're preparing. So you can't always avoid it, um, but try and be ahead of that. I, su I suppose too, if you're, if you're worried about that, then the, the asynchronous approach might work best for you because you could, you could actually kind of pre-record your webinar or, so, 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 that, so, so that you've worked your way through some of these technical challenges before you eventually build up the courage to go live. Yeah, exactly, and that's what we say here, time your practices, see how long it takes you to get through things. Um, my um, kind of guidelines I usually use is three bullet points on a slide takes a minute, but it can be a lot longer if you're doing a more discussion thing like we are right now. So you kind of want to see what your normal times come out at. Okay, so while we're talking about design as well, you want to think about how you're designing your slides if you're using a slide deck. This is, this is applicable to even when you're not doing webinars, but it's super applicable for, for webinars, but very good if you're using slides and lecturing as well, is that you should think about these as they're bullet points, they're not script. Don't have a whole chunk of text on there, because then what you get this read versus listen dilemma. So people are busy reading all that text on the slide, they're not paying attention to you, and they've forgotten what you were talking about. So keep it bullet points nice and short, like we've tried to do with all our slides. There's a few times where you can't avoid it, you have to have a bit more text, that's fine. Uh, just try and limit it as well, or split it into multiple slides. Um, you don't want to be overbearing people. So again, as some other tips we have here as well is avoid visual clutter. As you'll see in a lot of my slides, I've got my text on the left-hand side, and I've got a nice um, image on the, the right to remind people about what we're talking about. We're talking about slides, so here's a slide projector. And that can really help if someone's maybe been distracted for a few seconds, um, and they're coming back to it and you go, oh, what were people talking about? Well, there you go, that nice visual reference. Keeps everything nice, separated. Also helps if you've got people with um, reading difficulties, such as myself, I'm dyslexic. So if you mash a bunch of text together with images, it's hard for me to parse what are the bits I should be paying attention to. So I like it when things are nicely separated out, bullet points, that really is helpful as well. And, sorry, go ahead. John. No, and, I, I, and you'll see too, helpully, when you get this slide deck, you know, we've, we were including links out to some useful slide template sites uh, and where you might find some engaging images. Uh, that all comes as part of the, part of the package. Yeah, indeed. I'll, I'll quickly show these actually, because I think it's worth um, noting them. That these slides, all the ones that I use as well, come kind of things called Slide Carnival. 
um, where you can just download templates. You can kind of pick what style you want, a creative one. And then they're just, you can select them and download them and use them. So don't worry about trying to make your slides look pretty. Go and use a template. Let someone else do all that design work for you. You're trying to get the information across, not necessarily uh, a lesson in design. Similarly, uh, good images, uh, Unsplash, free to use images. You can come in here, grab some nice uh, images that you want to use, uh, get them in your presentation. You don't have to mess around trying to take your own pictures and stuff like that. Yeah. Again, think about what it is that you're trying to convey. Don't go doing all this extra work for something that doesn't move towards your learning objectives. And, and you'll be doing this in other aspects of your learning and teaching. So un Unsplash is, is, is really useful for these kind of open images. Uh, you still need to give attribution for, but you mm -hmm. can use in your in, in your learning materials. But of course, if, if you do a Google CC image search or any of any, or actually a range of search engines will allow you now to search for Creative Commons images. Uh, you can take the image and, uh, and I, I, I follow, follow the attribution rules, uh, and then you're allowed to use them in your learning teaching materials and publish them openly. Yeah, I, I should mention as well if you use Creative Commons own search engine CC search it will give you a little thing you can just copy and paste for the attribution so you don't have to worry about, oh, how do I say whose this was? They, they automate that for you. So really, really good tool to go out there and use. So we've had a bit of a discussion there of, of designing slides and designing webinars. And what we have is a quick teaching challenge for you. So these are our challenges that are to get you going out and trying some of these ideas that we're presenting instead of just leaving them on the back burner for ages and then forgetting what they were. So our one for today is to redesign one of your old slide decks with the principles described above. So have a think about reducing down the number of, of words on the slides, turning it into just bullet points, getting those engaging templates or images involved as well to make it nice and easy for people to, to see what's happening. Just go and give it a go. You'll find that you, you can turn an old slide deck that was maybe a bit cluttered and wasn't great into a really usable nice one in almost no time at all. It's just about editing down, really. And, and while we're giving you that link to nice templates, uh, of course, within within PowerPoint and also within Google Slides, uh, that, that there are other other templates that encourage you actually to to, to adopt this the, the, this approach. Uh, so there's a range of ways you can you can you can simplify your your, your template. Yeah, indeed. Uh, okay, so what we're gonna have a little think about now. Uh, one thing I'll do is I'll just move my little image box down. So one thing to bear in mind when you're recording webinars is where your image is appearing if you're doing picture in picture. We're talking about it now as I just did it. Um, to move this image around in Zoom, the software we're using, which we'll talk a bit about later, I can move my image around and the audience can do it as well to uncover bits of the slides. So I try to keep it on the bottom left because that feels like a natural place for me. Occasionally I might have to move it depending on what we're doing. So that's a thing to bear in mind. Try not to cover up your own slides. Um, but so a, when you're doing a webinar, a lot of the things that, that, that people at first find a bit daunting is maybe the technical side of things, getting things set up and, and trying it all up, out, trying it all up, trying it all out. And, and what we really recommend for this is give it a go ahead of time. Don't just show up on the day five minutes before and expect things to work. We set up at least half an hour before a webinar to make sure all our equipment is working before we do it. And then if something is broken, we've got plenty of time um, to go and get it, it sorted. So if it means us sitting around for 15 minutes and having nothing to do, that's fine, because at least we're happy that everything's working. So do set up and test in advance. And if it's a new software you've never used before, don't try to use it first time in your webinar. Do a test one before with some of your colleagues or just by yourself and with a machine signed in on a different account to test it all and check it's working. Really important. Thing. I think I think I think do it end to end. So you also yeah. need to find somewhere, find somewhere that's quiet and secure where you're going to be able to do it without any any interruptions. That's important. Uh, and also finding a finding finding a family colleague that's in a different part of the building or maybe on the other side of the country uh, to do a dry run with to make sure that they can hear you and you can hear them uh, and that your slides and things are all working. Uh, all, all of that's important, and you might do two or three of these dry runs, uh, and even then, again, do, do do a short dry run before you actually before you actually go live. Yeah, and that, and that kind of comes to our next point, which is know how to use and troubleshoot the tech. Like, if you're not super tech savvy, um, what I'd recommend is have someone there who does know a bit about the webcams you're using or whatever on your first run or two, um, so that you've got that person to call on if if, if things go wrong. You're not going to be desperate and get all uh, flustered because that's what a lot of this is, is just being confident and, and, and knowing that the technology is going to work for you. And you know what? Most of the time it does. We've only really had one problem 
um, doing our webinars so far, and that was caused by an update to our software and our machines that took away some of the permissions that I had so I couldn't share my phone onto my computer anymore, which is the second point that we got nicely here, check your permissions. Install that software, give it a go, see what's not working, speak to your uh, folk in IT, and they should be able to help you out with things like this, um, of making sure that the computer that you're working on, always do it on the machine you are going to be doing it on. So this is the laptop I use for doing the webinars. So we've made sure that everything runs on this machine. It doesn't have to be, there's one over in the corner there, we're not using that. So we don't care about what that one's doing. It has to be the machine we're working on. Really important. Uh, because if you try it on a different machine and then you come to your classroom and then it doesn't work, what are you gonna do then? Suddenly you're into that problem again of having five minutes and you're dashing about trying to get it sorted. Check it all beforehand on the exact kit you're using, if possible. Yeah, and I, th I think the other thing, as you get more and more confident at, at using these kind of technologies, uh, Ideally, a, a laptop, the camera, and the kind of setup we've got is is is, is based. Uh, but increasingly, you're going to find that, that that people will actually just go straight straight to mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoom, Zoom, for instance, and some of the tools that we'll chat about. You could, if you were quite brave uh, and more, more more accustomed to working in this way, uh, I could put my phone on a stand and 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 do a, a lot of this. Uh, without the, all, all of the more formal technology that we've got today. Yeah, indeed. Um, and that kind of comes to our second idea here as well, is logging in on a second device. So using your mobile phone that you've got sitting around, I've got mine here as well, uh, logging into your webinar, checking everything's working, make sure the audio is coming through fine, the, stream, the video streams there, just gives you that little bit of confidence as well, it's all fine. And you can just have it muted, sat next to your uh, machine, so if anything does go wrong, you can see quickly as well. Or uh, even better is having a second person there who can help out and look in at these things, make sure it's all working. Uh, another simple thing that a lot of people don't think about when doing it is thinking about the lightning in the background. Now, you're not always got massive amounts of control of it. We've only got certain rooms we can do these webinars in because we can only book certain rooms in the college, basically, to do them. So we're in these kind of, kind of um, office meeting spaces where we do these. So we're limited by our background. So we've got curtains that we can draw, which we have drawn. So we don't have people wandering by in the background. And we've got our nice standee, I think that's what those are called, yep, yep. standee to give us a bit of kind of background imagery. So we've not just got a plain boring background. And we whack the lights up to full because webcams don't always pick up the lighting great. We've got a pretty good one, but sometimes it, the image will still come through a bit dark. So Whack them on what full, and because I like wearing dark clothing, I just have lots of shirts that seem to blend into the background. <laughs> so it's uh, just have a think about that when you're doing it, um, of just getting that lighting in the background as best you can. Yeah, can really. as, as best you can, and uh, yeah. you, you can probably tell that wardrobe wasn't one of my considerations <laughs> uh, uh, today. Uh, but but it is that bit of while we are occupying that small square at the bottom of the the screen you're seeing, and it's really the the bullets and the content that it's important. Uh, it, is, it is important that you, you present and, and look well because all, all of that supports the, the learning. Yeah, indeed. Um, we should have got the hair and makeup department yeah, in to do us up before doing this today, but I think they are busy doing some actual work. Um, so, uh, moving on to other kind of technical, logistical side of things. Um, I'll say like we're spending quite a bit of time on this side of things because this is the important things that I think a lot of people trip up on and that's why people run into problems with, with webinars is they don't think about this before starting. They, they run in with the content, they're all excited that they've designed this amazing content and then jump into it and then don't get the little things right. So that's why we're spending quite a bit of time on these before talking about things like software you might want to use because uh, this stuff really, really is crucial. It's I, not exciting, but it's yeah. crucial. I, I, I think the, the challenge is uh, you might have or you may have some people who've got radio experience who are used actually uh, to talking themselves to no one in particular uh, and making it terribly entertaining. But that's a real art, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would really discourage anyone from, from attempting really to, to run a webinar just on their own. Uh, it's much more natural, as we're doing just now, uh, to make a conversation yeah. uh, and to have two, 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 two presenters. Mm -hmm, for sure. And it, it could be that one person's your primary presenter, they're going to actually be do, delivering the content, the other person's there to just bounce ideas to discuss off, or you could go with more what we're doing here, which is effectively we're both the presenter and we just kind of chip in when we have ideas or however it works. Um, so other thing is, uh, we've written this as tactics for text chat contributions. <laughs> tactics is the best word, but it kind of sums it up of how are you going to deal with the text chat? Are you constantly going to be monitoring it? Like I said earlier, are you going to have times where you're going to pull in information from your audience and use it? 
uh, just have a think about that beforehand so you're not trying to juggle presenting and reading the chat at the same time. And again, having a second person makes that a lot easier because then that second person can maybe be looking at the chat while you're talking. And, and some of the tapes chat, particularly initially, might, 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 might be about the actual webinar, but some of the initial text chat might be, help, I, I'm not hearing you, or help, I can't get in. Uh, we, one of us would need, would need to have a quick recheck of the, of, the, of the technology to make sure it's all working. Mm -hmm. So, so it, is, it, is, it is critical uh, that you have that tactic for, for how to handle check, text chat. Yeah, and also have a think about what time of day you're going to run it. So at the moment, we're every Tuesday at 2 p.m. We run them uh, because we know that's a good time for all of us to be able to fit it in. And we know that a lot of our colleagues can then uh, sit in on it as well. <clears throat> and then we also do it an evening session, which are going to be, well, evening, afternoon session, Thursdays at 4.30, because we know that most teaching staff have finished up lessons at that point. So they'll then be able to join in. Um, and we're only aiming for about half an hour to 40 minutes, so we're not going to have people staying late to watch them. Um, so just having a think about that. If you're doing this internationally, um, have a think about the time zone the other people are in. It might be one of you is going to have to compromise on, on a, a less convenient time for you to, to be able to fit it in. And it might be, again, that some of your, some of your, some of your viewers will come in live, uh, and, and, and some of them will inevitably just need to catch up asynchronously at a later date when they look at the recording of the webinar. And that's fine as well, because especially the way we design these is that um, if you're listening again, as it were, um, you're still getting all the content. You'll miss out on the, the BL to chat with your peers, but you can still do that via the forums and stuff, which is kind of what our follow-up is, yeah. is, is have another way for people to engage. Um, and also what we said here is when to email students, how many times and what to say. How are you going to inform people about that you're going to go live? Are you going to just have an email that's sent out? Is there going to be a link that's always live? But Zoom allows us to have a link that's um, always going to link to the webinar that we're doing. It's a permanent link. So that's really useful. But are you going to just be email out to everyone? Is that going to turn into a bombardment? Or are you just going to expect people to turn up at the right time? Some, some systems will also allow you to make sort of calendar appointments you know, mm -hmm. so that you can actually send an invitation out and it will go on people's uh, digital calendars. Yeah, very, very useful for getting people to show up on time. Um, okay, so we've kind of dealt with most of the, the kind of background things. But what we're going to have a look at now is, is thinking about what software you're going to use. And that might be what some of you come to this, this webinar are thinking, right, I really want to know what's the software I should use. And there's not a simple this is the answer, sadly. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I think that the reason there's not a simple, this is the answer, uh, is let's take it from the learner perspective, first of all. Uh, your intended audience are all going to be in, in different places. They might be at home, they might be in the workplace, maybe in a range of different environments, and, and they will have their own technical challenges. Uh, and you too will have a technical challenge because from, from wherever you're going to do your 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 webcast, uh, the network settings uh, and the and, and the network security will dictate perhaps which which tool that you select. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So um, this is why we kind of came up with our five points of things to consider when when choosing your software. So on the uh, right hand side of the presentation, there, have to think about which is left and right there for a second. Um, you'll see four logos of four common bits of software, which are Zoom, um, which is the one we're using which is uh, just kind of its own company, I think. Uh, Adobe Connect, which is made by Adobe, so it comes from a big suite of software. That one costs you money to use. Zoom's free. There is a paid-for version, which has some limitations, which we'll talk about. And then after that, we have Cisco WebEx, so that's W-E-B-E-X, uh, which integrates into a lot of Cisco products, so that might be really popular in your um, company or institution if you're already using a lot of the Cisco stuff. And the last one we've got there is Google Meet, which um, it can also, that's kind of like the corporate version of Google Hangouts, which you might be familiar with as well, which is another free one that you can use. Um, so when choosing, there's also other webinar platforms, but those are four of the, I think, the most popular ones. Um, when choosing one of these platforms, as Joe's already said, you want to think about what the technical considerations. Is it just going to be deployed within your institution where you know everyone's going to be using WebEx, for instance? Then use WebEx. Pretty easy decision there, really, unless it can't do the other things that you want it to do, in which case you want to move to another plat platform. Um, are you going to pay for it? Are you going to do, uh, is it going to be a free tool you need to use? Do you have some budget to buy something that's maybe got those extra tools that you need? Have a think about that as well. Um, 
how easy is it to use? Is it a case of click a button to join, which Zoom is pretty much like that. You click the button, put in your name, you're in the, the uh, webinar after downloading a little exe file. Um, or is it something where you can rely on your audience being a bit more savvy of knowing how to do things, then you might want to use one of the, the, the uh, heavier weight ones. I keep using WebEx as an example because I've had a bit of experience with that, where it's got a suite of tools and maybe you've trained your students off on how to use these and then you can do things like having people raise their hands, having people split out into little working groups that you then join together and you can jump between them. But then you have to make sure that your students know how to use that before going into it. Um, how are you going to invite people? So in our case, it's a nice link we can use. Or is it going to be a, just an in-house in thing where you need it to be private and secure? So have a think about that when you're choosing it. And finally, can you mute students' audio? That's quite important. <laughs> As if you've been to any webinars before where um, someone hasn't got the settings right and suddenly people are all joining in and their audio is automatically turned on and it turns into a riot at the start until someone hits that mute all button. Um, have a look at the settings, make sure that it conforms to what you're trying to do with the software. I don't know if there's any other points that you want to well, say, Joe. Well, I think that bit of, we've got mute students audio, but, but of course a webinar could be to your, your, your peers, but that, that whole bit about controlling the conversation flow, we, we don't do over and out and all these kind of things that you might do if you were <laughs> using, using old handheld radios, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that mute, control is, is, is actually really important for somebody who's got something to say. You can see that they've raised their hand and you allow them into the conversation because without that, even with you know four or five people in a, in a webinar, it can be quite challenging uh, to manage. Uh, and there are other solutions. We've talked about Google Hangouts. Uh, some of you may still be using something called Big Blue Button. Uh, there's Skype, of course, that comes with Microsoft uh, 365 out there. Uh, I think we've said all, all, all the right things about Adobe Connect and, and, and Cisco WebEx. Uh, the reason we're using Zoom and we'd encourage you to look at Zoom uh, and Google Hangouts uh, is because they're, they're, they're free and they're accessible uh, and they'll allow you just to start moving ahead in this space. Yeah, and that brings us on really nicely to talking more about Zoom and, and kind of the features it has and, and why we chose it. So obviously it's free. So our philosophy with doing all of the um, NMIS skills um, content is to use as many free products as we can and only ever pay for something if there's really not another alternative. Um, so Zoom is free. Um, the limitation is that you can only have a 40 minute meeting maximum um, if you're on the free account. You can pay a bit of money and then you get unlimited time. But we, we schedule things, still will only be about 40 minutes. And that might not be a bad limitation. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, back to this is not lecture capture. Uh, for lots of people having to concentrate for an hour, uh, even even with our sparkling wit and repartee <laughs> and, and, and these these slides, having ha having to commit to watching something for an hour and having to concentrate for an hour is actually quite a challenge. So for 40 minutes or smaller chunks of learning is probably quite appropriate for lots of audiences. Yeah. Um, so some of the other things with, with Zoom is that you can get anyone to can access it via a link. They don't need to have created an account, which is really attractive for us because we know a lot of people coming in who don't have accounts. They basically just download that little Lexi file that you've probably done if you've joined in live, and then that will run. And the advantage of that as well is that because it's just a little Lexi file, it will work on a lot of uh, institutional systems. It's not trying to install anything. It's just running directly from that file you've downloaded. So it's run, running directly in your browser, and, and that, that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, with lots of these other packages that we, we, we specifically mentioned, you know, like, uh, Adobe Connect and, uh, and so forth, you actually need to download a bigger application uh, or, a, or a bigger executive file uh, to your computer and that will often be blocked by, by your institutional uh, security settings or indeed somebody working from home, it might, might the, their security settings on their, on their machine might, might, might block the, the, the installation of that. Yeah, indeed. Um, one of the other great things with Zoom is support screen sharing, most of these do but it also allows guests to share their screens. So what we can do is if we bring in an expert, we can get them to share what they're talking about. They can bring in their own presentation and stuff so we can get them involved in presentations. So that's a, a, a quite an appealing feature. And that's a feature we'll use in future webinars. Mm -hmm. um, also, what's other great thing with Zoom is that you can set it to automatically record your webinars. So that's how we get these on YouTube. We tell Zoom to record it. Uh, it then processes the file at the ends, compresses them down, they're usually for a 40 minute one, it's less than 100 megabytes, so it's not huge. 
Um, and then it gives us an MP4 file and we can go and then upload that to YouTube. So it makes all of our processes really, really easy. We don't have to be running extra software to record as well as display. So really good solution, I think. And again, that's that asynchronous and synchronous. So synchronous mm -hmm. you've got us now and asynchronously, this, this synchronously it's being recorded and asynchronously <laughs> it'll be available on YouTube. Indeed. Um, so we'll just spend a little bit of time talking about Google Hangouts as well, because it's another free one, but it does have some limitations that we'll, we'll raise to you. Um, and just because we spent a lot of time talking about the Google products, because we are using G Suite as one of our main platforms for delivering the NMIS content. So we thought it was worth raising it here. So it can do um, video and text chat. Um, so very useful. Again, it does screen sharing and you can share different people's screens. It has a join via a link and stuff, but the main disadvantage to it is if you're not on G Suite, so you're just on a free account, you can have a max of 10 people involved in the meeting, which is not many, might be enough for what you're trying to do. But if you are on G Suite, depend, depending on the type you're on, it can be 25 or up to 100. So we get 100 with the educational version. If you're on the basic G Suite, it's 25, which is probably enough for most people. But if you're doing really vast ones, <clears throat> it might not suit you. And that's a similar challenge you might run into. I mentioned Skype, uh, Skype for business, and also the consumer version of Skype can hit a ceiling on the, the number of users, the number of collaborators that you can have in a meeting. Yeah. Uh, the other nice thing with Google Hangouts is that it is, like all the Google products, it works really well on mobile phones. Uh, Zoom does as well. We didn't mention that too much in the thing about Zoom, but um, Google Hangouts is really, really great on mobile as well. So that, that's one for you to bear in mind if you're looking at free solutions. Give it a try because you've got access to it if you've just created your own private Google account, so you can use that as well. I think, I think increasingly some institutions like, like us will begin really exploring the, the full suite of uh, Google Education apps alongside Microsoft 365. Uh, and so a lot of these tools will become available to you in, at institutional level. Yeah. Um, so we spoke a lot there about... Um, how we use webinars in the past. Uh, I don't know if the chat's working at the moment. We were having a few problems with it earlier. Um, but so we kind of want to hear from you and we could actually, we'll move this onto a forum discussion because we know people will definitely be able to access the forums of how have you used webinars in the past and what other uses can you think of uh, for them? How have you used them in the past, Joe? Hey, actually, mainly I've used them not as a, and again, really because of the kind of jobs uh, I've had. Uh, sometimes for disseminating things, disseminating information across the sector to quite specialist groups. So webinars for learning technologists, webinars, webinars for senior members of, 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 of college staff around a specific issue. Uh, but actually, probably more often, uh, while I would call it a webinar, it's probably been more like an online meeting that I've used the, the thing. So sometimes I've had to working for a client, I've designed slides and I've run a, run a session. Uh, but, but more often, actually, it's been about a webinar as a form of online collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really good for that. And uh, another use uh, that um, I've used it for back in the past in teaching days is bringing in an expert. So if you're doing a lesson and you know someone who's an expert in engineering, in, in electronics engineering, you could open up a webinar, have them on the big screen, have a camera set up so they can see your class, People can ask them questions, and you can do a bit of a Q&A with an expert in the field. Really useful for that. Um, so there are kind of multiple different ways you can use it. You don't just have to use it as a teaching tool, as it were, like a direct us teaching you. You can use it to bring people in uh, and collaborate as well. And, and, and increasingly, you know, things like the British Council uh, and other, other organizations ha have gateways that actually allow you to do international collaboration. So that expert could be an international expert or, or it could be learners talking to learners, it could be uh, international apprenticeship, apprentices talking to your apprentices or an international class coming uh, to talk to your, your, your class in a university or a college. Yeah, so we've got five minutes left and what we're gonna cover in that time is uh, some stuff about screencasting. So we told you all about how you interact with people live, but what if you're wanting to grow something for later use? How can you do that? And that's what we kind of call screencasting, as I said at the start of the presentation. Um, so one really easy way to do it is Zoom. So instead of having a, a webinar where you're inviting people to join you, just use Zoom to record it. Present it as you would here with your camera if you want one. You don't even have to have a camera, you can just have it turned off. And show your screen as I do here. I could be pointing at things, pointing them out. And then when I end the meeting, Zoom will generate that recorded file for me if I've told it to. So that's one easy solution to use. 
Um, I can't show you too much of Zoom because I'm using it to broadcast. I can't show you the interface because it hides it from other people, which is why you occasionally see me moving the mouse around. That's me interacting with Zoom. Um, one of the other ones that we really love here is called Loom. So a very similar name, but distinct, Loom. Um, like you spin thread on, I believe. And what this tool is, is a little plugin for Google Chrome. I do love my Chrome plugins because they're nice and easy to use. If I open it up, we kind of showed this off a little bit before. I'll move my video out of the way so you can see what it will do. Um, if I come in here, I just need to configure my camera so you can see the one on my laptop. And then if I open that there, is it gonna show my camera? There we go. So this is now using the camera on my laptop. So you can, hello, hiya. Um, <laughs> um, it will record your screen for you. So you can set it up in nice, easy ways. We just choose our microphone and the camera we're gonna use. We can choose what we wanna do with it. Do we wanna have myself in the, the corner? Do I wanna just have my screen only, get rid of my face? I can then make it so that I can get rid of um, my photo as well. So again, I've got nothing in that corner. Or I could just have my camera only. So if, if I wanted to just be doing a little instructional piece where I'm maybe gonna be holding up things, like oh, look, this is a new phone I've got, oh, isn't it amazing? Um, then we can use it in that way as well. Or we can do the kind of hybrid screen and camera, and then I can be using that to record my screen. All I need to do is hit the record button down here, and then I am just choose what I'm gonna record, which is my entire screen. So I'm now get a countdown. Um, and then I'm now recording. So I can basically talk about what I'm doing. Here I am doing my webinar. Here it is, here's Zoom, here's Loom. And then when I'm done, all I do is I hit finish. I think, I think for, 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 for many of you, a screencasting or screen recording is, is perhaps the, the least daunting uh, of, of, of this because mm -hmm. it allows you to really to have full control. Uh, you can add that voiceover uh, or, or to, to a presentation you can talk your learners through things. Uh, what I would encourage you to do if you're using Zoom or Loom or Big View in, in, in this sort of way is, is again, think about short, sharp chunks. Think about perhaps five minutes of learning or 10 minutes of learning. Uh, because again, back to it's not lecture capture. What you want to do is plan out a, a clear learning outcome, and deliver it quite short and sharp. Indeed. Um... So as you can see, it's recorded the video there and then that's it, ready to go. Very, very simple and easy to use. We'll also quickly highlight this other one that uh, Joe mentioned, which is Big View, which is, it kind of allows you, it does a, a multiple things, but the ones we kind of want to highlight is that you can use it as a teleprompter. So if you're um, not confident speaking on the fly and you want to have that script for you to refer to, you can set this up to be your teleprompter. So you could record with Zoom and then have your phone set up to work as a teleprompter for you. Very, very useful. What it can also do is a bunch of other different things. So it can work as a video editor and maker where you can put in little transitions. So you can put in, like you see here in this little image, you can put in like banners at the bottom, logos. If you have a green screen, it can animate a green screen for you. It can do lots of really useful things. Okay, so we're running low on time. So what I'll quickly do is bring this up and we'll just point out what we'd like you to discuss in the forums. I'll move my image out of the way again, as I was talking about earlier. Um, and what we were wanting to know from you is what other video tools have you used in your teaching? There's probably a bunch of tools that you're already using. It might be YouTube. That's a pretty simple one. We're going to cover that in the next webinar. Or it might be some more uh, fancy things that you've got your hands on recently that you're really excited to share with people. And we're really excited to hear about them because it's the best way to learn about tools is from the people who are using them, um, not directly from the companies because they won't always tell you about the, the little things that make it great or the little things that make it a bit tricky, but you found a way to get it to work in the end. I think ask, ask your learners too. Uh, your learners are searching YouTube all the time and Vimeo and a whole lot of different platforms. Uh, and some of them will actually be doing, doing this. They'll be creating their own web, uh, their own video messages for, the, for, for their friends. F find out what platforms they like to use. Yeah. So that's the end. There's the credits for today. Thanks for joining us. We hope you learned something and we'll see you in the next webinar. Catch you next time. Bye-bye now.